write a passage. Put this into six. If all angles in the triangle are that What's it like being on the receiving end of the education system? <laughs> What's it like being in year eight when progress can dip? In the summer of 2007, Hove Park School in Brighton allowed a production crew working for Teachers TV to follow four year eight children for a fortnight. They were filmed in class, around school, and at home, talking to specially installed personal video cameras. You should really be stretched. The result was the series of revealing documentaries Follow the Learner. No, but what did staff at Hove Park make of their pupils' experience? Are the comments of individual students of any value to us as educators? That was, that was number three. And have the children told us anything we didn't know already? Trevor Aver Beeson has been a head teacher for over a decade, helping transform some of the country's most challenging schools. In this program, he'll be trying to get some answers from those involved. Hi, I'm here today in the library of Hove Park Upper School. With me today is Tim Barkley, head teacher of the school, some of his senior staff, teachers, representatives from the local authority, colleagues from local universities and some teachers from other schools. Before we get into the issues that we're discussing today, let's remind ourselves what the programme series was all about. One school, four year eight children. Bradley, Jack, Louise and Robert. My teacher, she, she includes us in everything and it's just really, really fun because she makes us do all these get up and go exercises. Back in your seat, Brad. When the teachers ask me to sit down, I normally don't because I'm a fidgety type of person and I don't really like to sit in one seat at one time. Now, it's a shame because you've had quite a good lesson so far and it's a shame that you have refused to do the work. Thank you. I think that year nine is going to be too hard and I won't be able to do hardly any of the work. It's harder. It's harder. Brad, traffic lights, which are you? Halfway. Tim, as a fellow head teacher, I'm feeling you must have been a little crazy to um, let the cameras into the school for a couple of weeks. How do you feel about it now? I think it's, uh, it's been interesting and, and uh, through the production um, process there's been a whole range of different things we've gone through in terms of which students might be followed, what sort of events would be followed um, and how to capture the student's voice. I think that's quite a tricky one in lots of ways and I think there's lots of, of learning points within the videos that we've seen that we can take away and use in school and I think they're replicated in other schools as well so I think that uh, I think the learning that we can get as educators from these is quite significant. But did, did, you, did you feel that it that you could all be natural with the cameras in front of you? Did it kind of change the atmosphere and the way that youngsters and teachers behaved? I guess it, yeah, it did in some cases, but not all the cases. And I think the cameras became very accepted quite quickly by lots of young people. I think that uh, certainly teachers found it quite challenging to start off with, and sometimes challenging as things happened in the lessons as well. Um, you know, having someone else in the, in the uh, classroom whilst you're dealing with issues can be, uh, add that extra dimension. Gil. You work for the lo local education authority. Um, there was a, a, a big emphasis on, on year eight in the film. I mean, that's, that, that's the students that were followed. Do you think that was a, le a legitimate area of education to concentrate on? Well, I think, as Tim said, I mean, it, there are many things to be learned from all of these exercises, but the opportunity to follow learners through their activity in, in such a detailed way is rare. Now, whether or not one concentrates on any one particular year group, I think is probably irrelevant at this stage. It's more important that we have a chance to look at all groups. And so this is an example, I think, of good practice that allows us to analyse what children see. It is the children's voice that we're getting. We're getting better at listening to young people in all aspects of life. And this is a good example that can be used as a learning experience for schools across the city and, I suspect, nationally. And, and did you think that um, we learned anything about the, the, the so-called year eight dip from what you've seen? Um, yeah, I think we probably did in, in, in as much as it, it reinforced some of those things that we know, that that year eight stage is, is a particularly difficult time in children's growing up. Um, when we go through the activities, you know, we, we see children 
lying about as well as running about. But I think it gave us a chance to see the vast variety there is, particularly in learning styles and particularly in patterns of work. Jason, Tim, Simon, your teachers in the school, did you think as a snapshot that was a fair representation of the school and of Year 8 students and lessons? I think it does show the complexity of learning in a, a large comprehensive school. You saw the child who lives on the other side of town and how difficult that is for him. The different social contexts that the children come from. The different learning styles in each of the subjects that, that you visited. And even within the, I think the three language lessons that, that you showed, there were different learning uh, requirements uh, exacted of the children uh, as a class. So I thought it was very good, yeah. Tim? I thought it missed out some significant things, like how they eat or where they eat, some of their free time. And we also heard a lot about uh, some of their other activities they did, but we never actually saw what they do do outside of school. So I think in terms of exposure to lessons, possibly there was a fair, fair kind of smattering of what, what goes on. But it, I think in terms of what's going on in those children's lives outside of school, I think it's still quite a lot missed. I think it's certainly a fair representation of Bradley, what he said outside of school. Um, certainly reflects how he comes from in the schools. So I'd say he's a very honest individual, whatever he says. Um, yeah, I think it does reflect what most of your eight feel. Some of them feel a bit worried about what they're going to do when they get into year nine. Mm. Um, some of them seem to have lost their way or feel like, what, what is the focus for this year? Because I'm already here, I've been here for a year, I'm not quite year nine yet, so where am I doing? Where am I going? So that's maybe where the teacher needs to step in a little bit more and be a bit more focused on how the, the students' activities are directed. Chantel. It's been an interesting experience. Um, it's, made, it's made me stop and reflect on how I come across, because you just kind of do your job and you get so used to thinking you come across in one way, and then you see it and you go, oh, <laughs> you come across in a different way. So it's been really interesting sort of self-reflection as well. We're all being a bit chummy. Nobody feels that it was, uh, there was anything unfair about any of that. Well, could raise one issue, which Steve. is I doubt whether 25% of the Year 8 are girls and 75% are boys. <laughs> right. And in this particular case, the programmes chose to follow three boys yeah. and one girl. Whether that indicates that certain issues are related in a, in a gender-specific way, um, I, I, I don't teach here, so I'll leave that open to you. But if you're saying, is it a fair snapshot, that's one way in which it's not. OK. I think, I think also Tim. that you should point out that these are children having been identified as underachieving children. And so that's the focus of the, of the programme. Perhaps, if, you know, if you'd chosen different groups of children, perhaps um, it would have been interesting to see those that are achieving well beyond um, or the middle ground children, because these are particular children who are not achieving what they should do. OK. All right, well, on that. What comes across clearly in the film is that youngsters have very different learning styles. History by miles is definitely my favourite lesson. Uh, the role play and the teacher. Is, oh, yeah, main subject. You need a good teacher. I don't think we need to write today. Yay. Oh, yes. Because it's Ooh. Friday afternoon. But we need to use our thinking. We need to use our sympathy. No scars. I think the boys in the class, they like all the um, role plays, not having to write much and stuff. And I think that's what the teachers are doing, because they're just appealing to the boys most of the time. Because that's the easiest way, you know, you just do a role play, but um, actually it's not teaching us anything at all. Judy, some contradictory views there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you feel about hearing what they had to say. Well. The history experience last year was pretty awful for um, that class because it was a split class and I taught them once a fortnight. Um, I think Louise's point about not having enough writing is probably true, generally speaking, for the year. Um, as head of department, I usually exact quite a, a large amount of writing from them uh, and will be doing so in the future. <laughs> um, I wanted them to do something active. I, I take the point that not everybody learns by doing, but neither does everybody learn by sitting there on a Friday afternoon and writing. 
they did have to use their listening skills for the video. They, and I think they did learn um, myself because it was quite a lively lesson and we only just finished on time and that was only because the cameras were in there are probably overrun by about three or four minutes if uh, you hadn't been there. Um, but a fair point and um, I think it indicates the need to give children more choice, which again I try to do quite a lot of the time. Give them a choice of activity is the answer. Charmian, what do you think about the, what the film tells us about the different ways in which youngsters learn? I think as a teacher, you always try and treat all your pupils equally. And I think what it's brought home to me is that I don't know a lot about their backgrounds. And for some of them, they achieve far more than you realise they're achieving um, when they've had to get up very early, when they come from difficult backgrounds when they've travelled from the other side of the um, city. Um, I think I've learnt something, and it's very interesting for me to hear the comments of the pupils, and I think all teachers that see the film, you, we will take on board all the comments and we will think about them. And I know some of the comments I've heard that I will take on board and I will think about. James, you're involved in training teachers at university for the future. Do you think the film's... Tell us anything about the way in which boys and girls learn differently. I think they can give us some really good illustrations of um, this aspect that we call learning styles. You know, are you a visual learner? Do you learn by listening or do you learn by doing? The, the difficulty is that um, if we simply pander to one learning style, uh, we're not actually then creating a rounded learner. So if you've got, for example, a couple of those children who are really active learners, who learn by doing, as teachers what we need to do actually is to bring on some of their other learning skills to make them much more rounded learners and they are better. Now Louise, for example, said, oh well, you know, um, it's role play. Um, actually that's not teaching us anything. And there is a bit of a misconception here with, that children have, which is when you're doing a lot of writing, you're working very hard and you are learning. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, it's really pleasing, actually, to see the variety of um, methods and pedagogies uh, that teachers at Hove Park were putting into their lessons to try and bring some of those aspects of learning forward from children who perhaps are more visual or more auditory than those who are actually uh, the, uh, the learning by doing. OK, well, we've got a number of teachers in the room. I wonder if anybody's got any thoughts about uh, what they've seen or what they've heard. Emma? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just think it does highlight the massive range of pupils we've got at our comprehensive schools now and how difficult it is to meet the needs of all of them um, and that we've got to look at ways to find out what the needs are. I think sometimes maybe girls feel that if they haven't done a lot of writing that they're not working hard. I mean, it's not just gender specific, but I think the video does highlight some differences. Uh, Huxley? Do you think that, that you, you will take or do take account of this kind of gender difference here at Hove Park? I think we do, and I think that comes from a whole range of experiences. I mean, apart from the, 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 the action research that the television programme has actually, has actually generated, we also look at data. I mean, data is extremely important to a school like ours. We're always looking to improve, develop, and make sure that all learners are coming out with a real level of success at whether it's 14, 16, 18. And fundamentally, we've noticed, like a lot of schools have, is that there, yeah, there is a significant, in some occasions, in some subjects, um, difference in achievement between boys and girls. What it did highlight was there are different expectations of learning, there are different expectations of what make appropriate tasks to support the learning. I think one of the things I would be fascinated to find out is to actually re-interview those students to get their sense of what is a good task for learning, not just for them, but for other students, and for them to have some sense that actually there are a range of different learners in the classroom, and as somebody said earlier, that, that as a group, they need to develop individual, but also group learning skills as well. Does anybody think that, that what they've seen and, and what they've heard uh, leads us in the direction of teaching boys and girls separately? I think if you, if you look at a, a lot of the research that's out there, they'll say, well, actually, girls do better in single-sex schools and boys do better in mixed schools. Well, you can't have that, can you? But actually, you probably could. You probably could. Um, for example, if you were to take um, a mixed comprehensive, such as this one, and perhaps in some lessons teach single-sex, 
So you may, for example, have your history lessons where you'd have a class of boys and a class of girls and you teach them separately. Now, I've taught and observed in schools where they have uh, a mixed um, approach for certain aspects of the curriculum because we do actually need girls to calm down the boys and to try and get the boys to develop a little bit faster because we know that they're always uh, a little bit behind. What we do need, however, is, I think, to make sure that when we are teaching, um, that we're not trying to cover all the bases all of the time, because what that leads to is, is a sort of a mishmash of a lesson. You sometimes do need to focus. Simon, you wanted to cut in. We are trying single-sex classes and languages. You know, we are, as a language college and a specialist subject, we're trying to pioneer <coughs> certain uh, trends, if you like. So we've, we've uh, segregated a few classes in Year 8 and Year 10 to see whether we can use certain learning styles you know, that are peculiar to each of the genders. Um, as you know, in, in languages, girls outperform boys quite considerably. So we're attempting to reverse that trend at Hope Park. Are you not, G G I'm sorry, are you, are you not then taking a risk of just, just in the end teaching girls to one particular dominant learning style and boys to another? Is that not the risk that you run? Because what I was impressed with is the fact that there, um, that there was quite a lot of risk taking in some of that film, mm -hmm. which I think you know, is, is something that we're trying to develop, I think, with teachers, that you know, we're, we're always tasked with the behaviour management issue, and actually here we are examining the possibility of doing things which are a bit out of the box that the girl in, in question didn't really appreciate, but actually was working very well with the boys because they certainly enjoyed the lesson. Part of a comprehensive school, a mixed comprehensive, I think, is people being able to mix and appreciate and understand different styles. So it might cause a little bit too much segregation, I think. Tim, at Hove Park, it's going to come down to your decision probably in the end. <laughs> Possibly. Um, I, I mean, to my mind, the idea of debate about groupings is an interesting one. Why are we talking just about gender? We're not talking about different learning styles or t people's different starting points or people's ethnic backgrounds or um, free school meals. There's a whole range of different ways you could group um, pupils to try and improve a different sort of, or often a different way of working. And I think to segregate it into a very simple one, gender, I think is missing the point. Okay. Judy, we ought really to come back to you. You, you kicked this whole discussion off. Um, I think it's important that students or learners or anybody um, realise is that it's the thinking that's important and that very often perhaps girls feel secure when they've done a page of writing even if it's been copied from a book where they haven't actually done any learning at all they feel satisfied or any pupil might feel satisfied boy or girl but we have to encourage that learning is about asking questions rather than just finding answers in primary schools it's often said that they teach students. Secondary schools, we tend to teach subjects. Are we meeting all of our young people's needs? Let's have a look at this. In geography, quite often I'm finishing before other children and so I have to do a lot of like sitting around and I don't really have anything to do. The reason why sometimes I don't like writing is because it's got just too much description and some of the words that I don't know, there's no point me listening to because certain never tells you what it's like or describes the word or tells you the meaning of it. You weren't in time spent, were you? What? You weren't in the time spent thing. So why don't you write down, I found, I found out. I don't like writing. I found it hard, but I know it up here in my head, but when it comes to writing it down on paper, I find it hard. A lot of frustration emerging uh, in the programme amongst some of the students, some being stretched and some not being stretched enough, some understanding uh, and, and others not making the progress that they'd hope. Is this style of education, Linda, the kind of education and curriculum that is serving all the students' needs, do you feel? 
I think I um, reiterate things that other people have said about having a, a variety of styles. I mean, it, I, the great thing about this programme is that it's given people the opportunity of really uh, having an in-depth study of a number of different people, which perhaps you don't get when you're just seeing a range of uh, children every day. Um, it seems to me that we, we, we clearly aren't getting the best out of a significant number of people. And the more we can learn about the work, different features of children's learning and the, the variety that we have to uh, apply to them, uh, the, the more chance we have of, of taking each individual to the stage which they can get to. Stephen, when you're um, training your teachers on your PGCE courses, is it the teacher's responsibility to get that out of, of, of the youngsters? Or is it, you know, how much of the responsibility is the students? And if they don't ask, they don't ask. I think we're in danger of viewing the school as a deliverer, the child as a client or customer. And therefore, when we talked about learning styles and so forth, we ended up in a dialogue which was one of how can we meet that need? It was particularly striking in, in the scene with Louise. She had an opportunity as an autonomous learner to say, I have done this, where do I go on? She didn't do that, she didn't take that responsibility. With one of the other students, the parents' evening, the parents uh, revealed that the child was short-sighted, needed to be towards the front of the class. I think that was Brad, no, Jack, it was Jack. Now, learning is a partnership. Gil pointed out you know, earlier, it's not an individual process. Therefore, there's a relationship with school and with parents and a degree of autonomy, particularly in secondary school, we look to foster and develop. We're looking to you know, have autonomous learners lead. On that kind of basis, no, I don't think we can honestly say it comes solely down to the responsibility of the teacher to do that. We have to say we're working in partnership. Tim? I think that's an interesting one because at secondary level, the student does become quite a powerful person, the relationship between school and parents. Um, and you know, the issue of the glasses is an interesting one because clearly he doesn't like wearing glasses in front of his friends um, because they're considered to be uncool, maybe. Um, so he's removed the glasses from the whole world of education behind his mother's back, or, and no teachers know about it. So he's cleverly controlling his environment and learning quite a lot about how to manipulate the world around him. And we often get this with things like students' coats, which are very unfashionable to wear, where a parent will say, I've bought my son a coat, it's, it's been stolen. And eventually we find out that the actual child has dumped it in a bush because it was so uncool he didn't want to wear it and then said well the school's lost it it's something to do with the school so using that um, gap between school and, and home is quite um, an effective way of, of uh, a student taking control of their environment but just coming back to the issue about setting I think it's interesting about these two phrases, setting and mixed ability, and you spoke there about primary schools. But primary schools, of course, that's a mixed ability setting in a very, very clear way. There is an obsession, I think, among some people that the only way to get the best learning experience is to set. Um, and that's fine when you're in the top set, but I spend a lot of time talking to parents who are in the second or third set about why they're not in the top set, because they demand we would like to have that set because we want to have the best for our child, and the best for our child is set one. One, one of the key points in this is we've, we followed the learner. To a certain extent, we followed the teacher, so you had a bit of the teacher. What you didn't see lots of was the interaction between the students. Where you did see it, and I think it came to your point about the learning styles isn't just about those that we can name. It's about how we learn from others, how we interact with others. And actually, there were some terrific relationships at break times as well as in the classroom that provided youngsters with confidence and different ways of thinking that we haven't actually talked about. So you've provided a platform for learners within the school, a formal pattern of structure of lessons, but also a pattern that enables them to interact with their friends that was identified in the role play, but also carried out in other lessons. So if we are to stream in any way, we need to be clear why we're doing it and what the end result is. And it has to be balanced against that interaction of all children together, as we have in society. James. At Sussex, we have a, a quite an innovative PGCE course for training teachers, where they're trained to teach at the upper primary and the lower secondary. And I know Herve Park has taken some of our trainees and some of our trained teachers from that particular course. And they have a bit of a unique perspective. Certainly at the, at the lower end of secondary, there are aspects of primary teaching which I think could easily be translated into year seven, year eight, and possibly going up even into year nine. And likewise, aspects of the, the subject approach 
um, which sometimes can be hampered in, in primary. Now, a number of schools I know are beginning to value teachers who have been trained specifically at that key stage two, three interface. Does anybody feel that, that there's a danger that we're not meeting any of the students' needs from what we've seen? I think that's a big issue because we, we, we have a lot of information. There's been a massive amount of research about children's learning. But do we have the means to provide for the diversity that is out there? I think anyone that's been to school knows what school's like. And a lot of the same things that you would have seen when you went to school still go on because some things haven't changed. And they're very big, scary things like numbers and money. and Classrooms, <laughs> teachers, students. Yeah, and the fact that it's all within four walls. Blackboards have become whiteboards. Angela. I just wanted to come back to a point that um, that gentleman there raised, which is about um, that the, seeing the, the student as kind of the passive part of the partnership. And I think it's really important that, and as been said before also by Tim, that the, you know, the child is not kind of done to, that they, they have a responsibility. And, but I think it's really crucial that schools raise an opportunity for children to feed back to teachers about how mm. they're doing or what their particular learning style is or where they think they've learned and where they think they're not learning in, in a dialogue, you know, which is non-threatening, because I think both for the teacher and for the student that can be a very difficult thing. So I think there's a training issue there for the students as well as the teachers about how that could work. But I do think that's also a, a, an opportunity to go move that whole debate forward. Judy. I think the students should have inset days in the sense that all these things can be could be discussed in workshops about behavioural expectations. Um, and work with students, not necessarily in their groups, to hear each other's voices, as well as the idea of the voice comes, you know, to us. It should be that they should be able to learn what is expected of them. They should have training on how to manage at school. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we have training, and we are off. We are often asked for our ideas, and that would be an ideal time for them to give their ideas and, and their thoughts, which would, some might be common to quite a few learners and some might be, you know, ridiculous, but it would give a proper and professional voice to them as students. Becky, every student in the film seemed to love PE. What are you doing? I mean, I only saw Louise comment about PE, but she's a student who loves all her sport, so really there wasn't sort of a, a cross-section of students in PE that was representative. I mean, there's another student I could probably pick up that would probably say they hated it, hated bringing kit, hated participating, but for us, luckily, <laughs> it was Louise who has a very positive attitude towards the subject. You didn't was... need to admit to that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's now on film. No, that's OK, but no, generally there is, you know, a lot of kids love their sport, but on the flip side of that, you've still got your minority who would be sort of qu probably quite negative. But, yeah, Louise, to us, is, you know, a fantastic part of our... You know, class, and she'll love doing anything we did with her. She would think was great. So. Is there something though that you 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 see that you're doing in PE, just by maybe its very nature, it's outdoors, it's moving, or you know whatever it is that it might work in in other areas of the curriculum? Yeah, I think a lot of the kids have so much energy that when they do get a bit of chance, they have a bit of freedom, they thrive on it completely. And if you could bring it into other subjects, it probably would be useful. But as Tim was saying, within four walls, when you've got 30 students, yeah. it's kind of impossible that you can do that. Like, like yeah. Brad was saying, he hates it when he's told to sit down, sit down. But obviously you couldn't have, as we do in PE, 30 kids yeah, running, running around. around. It's just not practical. And also, because we do a lot of extracurricular, you can build slightly different relationships with pupils. You know, their parents come along to support, and mm. that does make a massive difference, I think. Judy, you seem to like them running around. Um, <laughs> I would like to say about something about this idea of the student as the, you know, we're delivering something to the student. We're all imposed upon by the people directly above us. I mean, we are imposed upon in the sense that we have to carry out the policies of the school. The school is imposed upon because it has to um, carry out the wishes of the government and the LEA. Um, and there's a sense in which sometimes it's lost that the student is actually a human being. And they, in my view, have a very different agenda to the one that the government and the school and even their parents have. They have a different life experience and they're learning all sorts of tricks to survive in the system. And I think that that's important to remember, that we 
they are human and they will try and get out of things. They won't wear their glasses. They'll put their trainers on. They'll do anything because that's the nature of what they are. They're delightful, wonderful young human beings who will be mischievous and undermine the system. Stephen. Interestingly, talking about getting outside of the classroom, the issues of the experience of the classroom, one of the things that we're introducing is the notion of a non-school placement, with the idea that there's much to be learned about how we learn and how we teach by being outside of the school, as well as looking across phases. So I think there are many messages here that are very, very similar, and they all speak to the need to, for diversity and flexibility in the way that we teach and the way that students learn. Huxley, do you feel that Hove Park is meeting the individual students' needs? Are we meeting everybody's needs? That's a big question. Um, but I think one of the things that seems to have come through in discussions about the curriculum, skills, the divide between sort of independent, autonomous learners who can make mature decisions about where they go next and what they do next, but also the tension about where we see young people at 16 and at 18. I mean, where society is changing. The young people who are leaving Hove Park at 18, between the age of 18 and 60 or 65, whatever the retirement burden is at that point in time, may have six, seven or eight different jobs. The jobs may be in different sectors. The jobs may involve a whole suite and a whole range of different skills. And I think this is a big issue for schools across the country. And that is a tension between producing a young person that can come out and can work successfully in this ever-changing environment that we see young people moving into versus the sense that actually they will be measured sometimes in a very knowledge-driven and knowledge-focused way. So again, I think all schools need to be looking at the end point beyond 16, beyond 18 and saying, are they catering for the needs for students to have a suite of skills that will enable them to learn from 18 right up to 65 lifelong learners? So if they're put in a situation where they have to solve a problem, they can work autonomously and independently. If they don't know how to do that, they at least have the skills to be able to ask and form relationships to create that sort of understanding their ability to achieve whatever they want to achieve in the job they're doing. It's about much more than exams. Simon, I wonder if you've got a thought about behaviour because um, I often felt that you can't learn and if you're not behaving, but maybe you don't behave unless you're learning properly. And we saw some disruption going on in, in, the, in some of those classes. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you, you have to engage the child if the child's going to learn. Uh, I mean, there was one excerpt where uh, I think it was, was it Bradley, who didn't have a piece of graph paper. And he, he quickly went off task, started talking. And to come back to the previous question about uh, do we teach individuals or do we teach subjects, uh, in a large school, especially in this school, um, learning to know the child is very, very important, but also it's very challenging for a school to organise well. So I think Judy was saying that she taught that class once a fortnight. Yeah. And so therefore learning those children, learning their different learning styles, when you only see them once a fortnight, is a hard <coughs> task. Nicola, um, science, <coughs> science teachers, you see, um, you see more of the youngsters, don't you? Probably maybe once a day or four or five times a week Pretty or much, something yeah. like that. Does that mean that you know them better and does that make the learning better? Or it... um, I've actually, I mean, I've, I find that in terms of building relationships with pupils, it's the actual, it's getting involved in the extracurricular stuff that really um, gets you to build relationships, gets you to know the pupils. I do see them a fair amount and I'm lucky with science that we have practicals and I can walk around the room, talk to them uh, and you talk about obviously the tasks that they're doing but you, you can talk to them about other things you've, you've noticed in the, um, in the bulletin that they've done a particular, you know, they've got a particular prize in something, you talk to them about that. Um, so I think as well as you know, delivering the curriculum it is about being interested in them as individuals. Okay. I noticed when we were talking about behaviour, and I think we might make an assumption that you, you have to behave in order to learn, or good learning makes you behave. But I think I saw some youngsters learning despite some disruption going on around them. In fact, some of the class was behaving quite poorly, but a couple of youngsters at the front of the class were learning quite a lot. I wonder if anybody else has any thoughts about that. Is our behaviour and learning so linked? They're not 
easily separated in some circumstances and they're very clear in others. Um, you know, a, a student um, like in the, in the art lesson, totally immersed in an activity, in, in that zone where everything's flowing and it's complete immersion in the work. There isn't an opportunity to do anything other than be immersed in the work. When there is a, a frustration then, or, or a delay in, in the sort of process or something that cuts into that, that's I think when um, off task attitudes take, take hold and distraction can happen. I think that that's, can stop learning, but it can easily flip it back by engaging them quickly in another activity. So it's a, it's a complex relationship, I think, behaviour and learning. And often behaviours are symptoms of other things and, and the symptom is not, you know, you know the actual um, reason for the behaviour isn't tackled, the behaviour is tackled. And I think that's, that's a big point to make. James. The single biggest concern that trainee teachers have is behaviour. What happens if you know, the group work goes wrong, the class goes out of control? How do I cope and how do I manage? So in, in teacher training, we, we spend a, a fair bit of time looking at behaviour management. And sometimes what we have to say to trainees is, you know, when you're asking classes to do things, how do you know that the children know what to do? So when you say to them, for example, OK, I want you to work in groups now. Who's taught them how to work in groups? Or I want you to take some notes, or I want you to look at this video and write down. Who's taught them how to actually do that? Uh, and I think sometimes that's something that we can miss. We make sometimes assumptions. I know that when I was teaching, I sometimes made those assumptions that, oh, well, I'm going to ask them to do something now, and I assume that they know how to do it. And very often, that bad, poor behaviour, and I think it was exemplified, um, where there was a test and they were unclear about what it is that they were supposed to do for that Spanish test, they hadn't really got to grips with what they were supposed to do in order to succeed at that particular task. So a lot of behaviour management is actually about clear expectations, clear instructions, and actually the pupils themselves knowing how to carry out what they've been asked to do. One of the key things in the programme uh, is that teachers use a wide range of styles to manage children's behaviour. Let's have a look at this clip. Ooh. One you. Right, folks, why she stop talking every second you waste now is time you'd be wasting a break. Sam, take it off, Jordan. Just get your jacket off. Jacket off. Still some people talking, folks. OK, Brad is going to help me out here. And he's going to draw the lines from the... Well, shall I do it now? Left, so I do to it the now? reasons on the right. Now, don't just draw them. You do the second one, Brad, because I know you've got them right. That one. Becca, can you name another type of food? Jamil? Protein. Well remembered. Stop for Becca. First one. <laughs> I think all the children think that stickers and combinations are a bit babyish and maybe they feel a bit embarrassed when they get one. Ollie. Minerals, another sticker for Ollie. Well done. Well, we see some very different styles of uh, management uh, of uh, learning and behaviour in the classroom. Some traditional approaches and some more informal approaches from some younger staff and teachers working with individuals and some really performing from the front. I wonder if anybody's got any thoughts about um, what we can learn from what we've seen. Jessica? I think it's absolutely the responsibility of the staff and the teachers in the school, whatever their role is within the school, that it's our job to teach the behaviours that we expect to see for the learning, exactly what you were saying. And we can't... We're dealing with so many children from so many different backgrounds. Their home lives will be so varied. And it's so key that we teach what we expect to see from the students and then consistently pick them up upon when they fall down, when they forget to, to you know, practice those behaviours. It's important that we have a systematic and consistent approach to, to dealing with poor behaviour. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, because I think one of the things that's crucial is um, this 
the students' responses in terms of where they felt safe and secure in lessons because the teacher was very um, in control of the class. They got their systems organised, their practice organised, and they, these children knew exactly where they stood and they knew what the expectations were. And when, they, when those expectations are not clear and they're not followed through and systems aren't happening, then the child feels that they can take advantage of the situation and are less likely to learn. Jenny in Geography. Anything we can learn from the different groups, the different people that you get in them, girls and boys, in terms of how they behave? I think, um, again, consistency is key. I think having clear kind of guidelines, knowing what's allowed, what's not, plus also variety, even just sometimes change of, of tone or um, rewards. Some kids respond really well to commendations and things like that. Whereas others, phone call home, for example, or... So I think variety is spice of life, almost. Do we have to be a bit more sophisticated with the way in which we recognise good behaviour? Yeah, I think it, it came up, um, commendations or stickers or something like that, they don't. So I think that's definitely something to work on and to kind of look at, yeah. What about the way in which the school organises its recognition and reward? Does it work for you in PE, Becky? We tend to give commendations for good behaviour and also we send letters home at the end of each term, sort of a letter of praise, which I think is fantastic because the parents obviously re receive the letter and usually it's a bit of a boost in pocket money for the students, etc. Yeah. But it's recognised and they come in saying thank you, thank you for sending that letter home. I think, again, sort of contact with the parents mm. in terms of good and bad behaviour is probably the most effective means. We've definitely found that. Yeah. We've got sort of postcards we send from time to time with little comments on and... It definitely does make a massive difference. Sometimes in secondary school, we think that they don't want their parents to know about these things. If you get parental support, it's actually really effective. So good and bad phone yeah. calls or Definitely. notes home, mm -hmm. Judy. I think you should always um, give oral feedback, mm -hmm. even when you have, uh, I, I dare say, this would be heinous to say, if you have an appalling class um, and you actually have five students doing the right thing, you immediately focus on the positive. I think a positive classroom with lots of rewards, and if they, I mean, I don't necessarily believe that students don't like um, commendations. I don't agree with that. You've only got the viewpoint of a very few students there. The evidence suggests that actually they do like them, even in year 10, um, and they like lots of rewards, and I too send postcards home, um, and I, plague senior management with good work, so much so that I think they probably get fed up with it, but they're very good and they always write home and that's an added sort of, you know, if they get, oh, Mr Barclay saw my work, Mr McCauley saw my work, you know, they really like it. But we all like to feel positive and why should children feel any different? They need to be told that they're doing the right thing. One of the things that's very hard to convince students of is that the carrots and sticks available to schools are actually quite small, really, in their way. It's all pretty small beer. But the consistency of approach and the fact that they're getting this in a way which is fair, which shows parity, that's where your payoff comes. Whether you're dealing with behaviour which is inappropriate or behaviour which is appropriate and you want to reward, it's the consistency across the school and within the classroom between lessons that pays off, ultimately. Huxley? I agree with that, but I also think there's a great complexity here as well in terms of the vast range of ways that you as a teacher can actually reward young people. Work we've done with students show that all year groups like to be rewarded, but they like to be rewarded sometimes in very different ways, sometimes quiet ways, sometimes public ways, sometimes covert, sometimes more overt, sometimes with monetary value, sometimes with no monetary value. Now, I think, and, and I think this probably raises, you know, raises issues for, for colleagues who are new to the profession, that actually you're not just talking about a pat on the back and a well done and off you go. You're talking about, and recently we've introduced a, a texting service where we can actually text parents um, to their mobile phones to say, your son or daughter has had a great lesson. Now, if, in terms of you know, potential complexity, that's really moving on the modes of communication that, that all colleagues can use to, to, you know, to pass on positive news about achievement and about behaviour, but also um, raises the bar in terms of the complexity of ways that you feed back to a young person and also to their parent or carer about what they're not doing and how you want them to improve and develop from mm. there. James. I think what it all boils down to, and this is what I say to my trainees, is that it's all about individual recognition. 
When you have children who are badly behaved, it's because they want very often to be recognised and they want to be taken notice of and they want to be a centre of attention for whatever reason. Now, if we can focus that individual recognition onto the positive side and we can look for those positives and we can recognise the individuals for the things that they have achieved. And sometimes, and, and Nicola made this point quite well, it's not necessarily about what they might have achieved within a science lesson. Very often, what makes a pupil feel really good is that their teacher has taken an interest in them as an individual and ultimately pu pupils do not want to be in classrooms where bad behaviour is there. They want teachers to be in control, they want teachers to actually have good, clear, structured lessons. And I think if we remember that, and that's what we say to our trainees, you will actually get there and you will have successful lessons. Jason? It's also quite important how you present yourself as a classroom teacher when you take that first lesson, when you talk about boundaries. In terms of uh, sanctions, I present them as what I will do. And in terms of rewards, I'll list the different rewards and I present that in terms of what I can do. And then that gives the student the right to decide how I reward them. OK, Tim, very briefly. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought that was interesting, the way that um, a reward, in a sense, for Bradley, uh, work for him in terms of involving in, in your lesson. I thought it was really um, a great way of motivating him because he's so technically made likes being involved and doing stuff. I thought that was quite an interesting way of doing it, winding in the reward with an activity which is learning. And there's that uh, very recent research which says that we all need to be uh, experiencing five good things to overcome one bad thing that happens in our lives. So hopefully there are going to be five good things that happen later on this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but watching the series uh, makes me feel a little bit like this was a children's mini Ofsted inspection. Let's just have a look at this. In the mornings, I'm completely drained of my energy, completely. It's just, oh God, school, what am I going to do? It's like an evil teacher, it's like evil vampires sucking, sucking your brains out and stuff. It's not very, like, high discipline. Um, because the teacher can't control the class very well and so it's very hard for me to learn and stuff. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. Reason why is because uh, when I like it it's because I know what I'm doing and I like the work. Sometimes I don't like it is because it's really hard work, it's too much to write and I don't really get it. Practice writing. I got lots of help from my teacher, which I do not normally like. Uh, but today was different because she actually helped me. Carol, how seriously should we take what the students are saying? You've done a lot of work in this area at Sussex University. I think we can actually learn from students. We can learn about how they learn about learning, um, about what hinders their learning. I think we also maybe ought to encourage a dialogue around learning for students so we can actually find out what is important to them and so that they can understand their responsibilities as a learner. So should we be asking for feedback from the young people in a more kind of structured, formal way, more frequently in the learning process? I don't think students ought to be um, running mini offsets on teachers at all. I think we can learn from students. As one year eight student once said to me, the best way to learn about how a year eight student learns is to ask a year eight student. And I think that sums up. We can actually learn about their learning from them, but I don't think they ought to be judging teachers at all. I mean, it seemed to me, watching the programmes, that there was a lot of introspection, that the youngsters thought quite a lot about what went on in school, or they did at least articulate it when they were asked. A lot of self-doubt and fears, <coughs> social and emotional issues that they brought up. Should we be trying to uh, address that a little more, Charlene? I think one of the things that really helps is getting to know your students outside of the classroom. Because if you talk to them frequently in the corridor, and if you pass the time of day, and if you have a smile and a joke with them, when they come back into the classroom, they actually see you as an individual and not a vampire. And um, so, yes, I, th I think the whole thing is important. And, I do think of students as individuals, but sometimes with big classes, I think you are aware that you can't give all the students the individual attention that they need. And you try and do it after the lesson, during break time, and sometimes you can actually see them at lunchtime and after school to try and help them out. OK, I don't think any of us thought you were a vampire. <clears throat> Jason. <laughs> 
talking about Robert, really, um, because I, I, I teach him science as well. Right, he's a very interesting character. He's very clever. Um, and what he said at home was right about it's up in his head, but he finds it difficult getting onto, onto paper. But I noticed when he was doing that, he was throwing something up in the air. So he was obviously very happy with that verdict. He, he judged the situation, so he decided that he can't write, and that's the end of it. So he's almost expecting people to stop what they're doing and come around to his way of thinking. And many students, because we're doing so much and trying so many different learning styles and giving so much different types of support, do actually manipulate that and take on a, almost like a consumer outlook on it. Yeah, so it, it, it sounds like you're saying that we, we, we can listen to what they have to say, but we have to... We have to take a professional distance from it as well, because yeah. we're there to deliver to, to 27 others at the same time. Hear it through the prism of our professionality and, yeah. and adultness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, I didn't catch you. That was Gil. I, I just wanted to pick up the vampire bit, and, and not, not the vampire model, but we've talked about consistency um, across the school. But one of the things that adds to the complexity of this is you can't have consistency in teachers. Teachers are all different people, and that's a critical part to children's learning. They're learning as much about the adults around them as they are as part of the learning process through education in the classroom. Gil, can They're I bring you, bring you back to... It, sh it, should we be listening to the, the youngsters' view of what we're doing? But I think they've given you that view, and I think that is what we're listening to. And I think what you're hearing is that everybody here is saying, when you forge a relationship with the youngster, that moves it onto another plane. Learning takes place at a higher level because there is a greater interaction between people. And that is a direct response. That is where the voice of the learner can come through okay. to the teachers and to the school. Tim, did you have something you wanted to come in on? Yeah, it's really about... Um that I think it should be co-construction, not, not in the sense listening to students and giving them what they want, but it is about sort of working together. So you, you get opinions, you get ideas, and you filter those and reshape those. Because there are, there are a lot of resistant forces in education. We've mentioned things like timetables and structures, but there's also emotional and intellectual barriers. Uh, parents wanting a particular sort of classroom uh, in rigid formats with people doing lots of writing. We've seen that. Uh, we've seen other, other people having other demands. We want this sort of education, we want setting, we want... And these demands are actually um, sometimes ill-informed, sometimes uh, informed, but there's a whole range of different ideas which resist change and resist the idea of, of, uh, of making a difference. Students can be very resistant to taking on new change which could help their learning. Huxley, pupil voice, not pupil voice? We did a very short project on training a small group of students to be observers in lessons. And a lot of the driver from that, for that, really came for, from a sort of open view that actually, when you have a group of students in front of you in a classroom, they will judge what happens in the classroom. Um, they'll judge the learning experience, the quality of the planning. And it may come out quite formally in terms of a discussion with somebody else as they leave the class, and that was a good lesson, that wasn't a good lesson. Or it may come out informally. Um, through their behaviour and through their, their response and through their, you know, you know, the process of learning. I think we do need to train and engage them into thinking about what happens in a good lesson because it means by doing that, we're not necessarily putting the emphasis on them judging, but we're actually producing and giving them the opportunity to have the skills to think about you know, effective learning and focus on thinking about what's gone into ensuring that they learn. So it's, it's engaging and, and getting to this process of co-construction. Also as well, informing us about you know, what a good lesson looks like to a group of students. Okay. Tim, I think one final question to you. Um, would you do this again? Yes, definitely. It's been uh, really interesting, the discussion here tonight, uh, the discussions as the programme's been made. Um, it's been fascinating. And I think uh, it'd be interesting to do it again uh, in a couple of years' time, see those learners in year perhaps 10, 11, and see where they are, see how progress they've made. Key headline that you think you've learned or gained from the exercise? Keep the debate going about the work we're doing in school, how we might improve it, and uh, listening to learners and, and uh, developing new ways and new strategies to really support the learning of students at all levels, not just year eight, actually. Well, thanks to everybody for taking part in this evening's debate and also taking part in the series. Thanks to Tim and all of the staff here at Hove Park. I think that I've learned that pupils have a voice and they have something to say. We can learn from them but perhaps we don't really want to start a children's Ofsted inspection team. Thanks very much. <laughs>